Our guest today is John P. Cosgrove. He's a U.S. Navy veteran of World War II and former president of the National Press Club. Mr. Cosgrove, thank you very much for being with us. I'm very happy to be here uh, and I look forward to reviewing my life in an interesting way to be enjoyable to all people who are subject to view the video later on. It's a fascinating life. Let's begin at the beginning. Where were you born and raised? Born in home in Pittston, Pennsylvania, 285 South Main Street. Dr. Underwood was the doctor. I don't remember him, but my mother said that was his name. And I was born at home. The Pittston Hospital was just down the street, but uh, this was the custom at the time. It was September 25, 1918. Pittston, Pennsylvania is a little mining town halfway between Wilkesboro and Scranton, Pennsylvania, northeastern part of the state, and the beautiful Susquehanna River. When and why did you come to Washington? It was the Depression years. There were no jobs. The coal mines were worked out. There was no future in that area. I had an uncle, my mother's youngest brother, who was a school teacher here in Washington, and he said there's no place no future here in Pittston. He said, if you would like to come to Washington, you can stay with us. He and his wife, both were teachers here in Washington, and until you find a job. And I finished high school and went back for a one-year graduate course at St. John's Business School in Pittston. In the meantime, I was working nights as, at the Pittston office of the Wilkesboro Record, trying to learn the business. And that's when I uh, decided this is the time to go, it was fall of 1937, to Washington. I got a ticket on the Greyhound bus, and it was an eight-hour trip. The Greyhound bus started in Scranton, picked up in Wilkesboro and all the other stations all the way down to Harrisburg, Harrisburg to Baltimore, Baltimore to Washington, arriving in Washington at about five o'clock in the afternoon. It was an all-day trip, and the terminal of the Greyhound Station then was right at 15th and New York Avenue, right between 14th and 15th Streets in full view of the White House, and I thought I really had arrived uh, really at the President's doorstep. <laughs> and that was, uh, this Washington was going to be my future and my fortune was here for me to find. Now even before you left Wilkes-Barre, we should point out, and we'll get to this later on, you've met 14 U.S. Presidents. The first time you saw a president was actually while you were still in Pennsylvania. You were photographing a re-election visit by President Roosevelt, correct? Well, it was a big thing for the president to come to a town or come to your hometown. And when it was announced that Roosevelt was run, running, campaigning for his second term, and he was going to stop in Scranton, his train would go to Scranton and then uh, talk from the observation into the car campaign talk, get into uh, to one of his cars, there were two White House cars, the open touring car, to drive uh, to Wilkesboro and to uh, visit all the towns along the way, but not a stop at any of the, uh, roughly about 18 miles from Scranton to Wilkesboro. But coming down through Pittston, I knew uh, the route he was taking and he would have to uh, slow down to make the right-hand turn from William Street to Main Street, and I had my father's Kodak, and I got up on top of the one-story building, and right at the line of the William Street, I knew I'd have one chance to take a picture of the president's car making the turn. Can you say that? And I time? took the picture, and I have it here, and I think you can work it into you to the interview. It turned out pretty good. There was. Um, there were no, no uh, big cavalcade of the president like you see today when the president travels. It's uh, unbelievable, uh, uh, stopping traffic all the way. The police, the local policemen, just had the peace, but people who wanted to see the president stand by, they could they could spill out into the street, but to stand by uh, for the for the president's car, two cars, two open. I think there were Cadillacs, open uh, touring cars. And the first car was the president, Sandy 
Davis, the mayor of Scranton, and George Earl, the governor of Pennsylvania, the governor of Pennsylvania, the three in the back seat, then the and the Secret Service men walking alongside, and then the car behind was a Secret Service uh, car to collect the Secret Service men who were walking alongside the president's limousine. And it's quite a sight, and the picture turned out pretty well. Of course, so that was the first view of a president of the United States. And of course, Roosevelt won that election in a landslide over Alf Landon, and so he was still president when you came to Washington in 1937. And it wasn't too long before you got a much closer view of President Roosevelt because you took a stroll one day by the White House, right? Well, yeah, I was, I was, I was strolling by the White House. I was sightseeing a Saturday morning and walked down to Southwest Gate and the east, uh, the West Executive Avenue, the Ave East and West Executive Avenue is border the White House, east between the Treasury and the White House, and the West Executive between the White House and the State War and Navy Building, the building that housed three cabinet offices. And uh, I was walking down there, the man stepped out, I said, wait a minute, and uh, the, he opened the White House gates, Southwest gates, and there, was a touring car with the top up on him, and uh, sitting in the back seat, the president and Mrs. Roosevelt with their lap robe over their lap, and uh, they were en route down to Charlottesville, the University of Virginia, where their son Franklin was going to law school. And they had taken this trip many times uh, during their son's uh, time at the law school there. and. Uh, it just went on. There was one car behind them, and that was like a station wagon, which I assume had the AP and the New York Times or Washington Post or Star uh, newspaper uh, reporters following him and the Secret Service. Just two cars. But shortly after that, I don't think it was on that visit, but short, right, right, right at about the same time, a car went through the uh, traffic light or a stop sign and almost hit the president's limousine. No, no pilot car, but then the Secret Service decided we needed a pilot car to run advance of the presidential uh, limousine. And they still had the station wagon behind. And that was the way the president traveled. Uh, the White House gates were always open on Pennsylvania Avenue. The fence was lower. The really easy access to the White House, people who worked at the State War Navy Building frequently would take a shortcut through the White House front gate or one of their gates and over to the gate by the executive office uh, where the Oval Office was located. And that, that, by the way, was built during the Theodore Roosevelt years. Until then, the White House itself, just that small building, although it was a good-sized mansion, um, it housed not only the president's family, but the offices of the executive office of the president, all in, that, in the White House. Through the Lincoln years, and Teddy Roosevelt said, uh, "I have six kids, said five, six, and I got to put my family in the house." So they built the executive office building over uh, towards the West Executive Avenue, and connected to the White House by the uh, low-lying building there, hidden by a berm, uh, actually, and. Uh, that's where Roosevelt started, the executive office, and the Oval Office was re rebuilt, Oval Office, looking, taking the Oval from the shape of the Oval Room, in the, the Blue Room in the White House. And that was the beginning of the uh, executive office in the Roosevelt years. Let's talk about uh, your jobs when you got here. What uh, media jobs did you get, and uh, what job did you have leading up to Pearl Harbor? Well, I, when I, I went to all the newspapers, there were five newspapers in Washington at that time. The St Evening Star was the dominant paper. It was located at 11th and Pennsylvania Avenue. The Post was in the building next to the uh, National Press Building. The Press Building was at 14th and F, and the Post Building was 14th and Pennsylvania, or 14th and E Street, looking into Pennsylvania Avenue. And the, uh, the Washington Daily News was a Scripps Howard paper. And then you had the Washington Times and the Washington Herald. Uh, later on, they combined those. Hearst, Hearst ran those pa that paper. And uh, those were the five papers. So I 
banged on the doors looking for a job and hoping to continue the experience I already had at the Wilkesboro Record. And uh, they're very limited, but uh, at least it was the beginning. And uh, I didn't have any luck, and the uh, newspaper girl was organizing, and that made it even more difficult for a, for a, a cub reporter to get a job in an established newspaper. But uh, one of the friends at the Evening Star said, uh, go to the wire service, the AP or UP, and they have what we call dictation operators. The reporters are out around the city, and instead of coming into the office to write their story, they just pick up the phone and they dictate it right to the typewriter, and you sit alongside the editor's desk uh, who, who's going to read your copy and mark it up and put it on the wire and send it out. And they call them dictation operators, and the wire services have, have a lot of young boys who are, do this, and they have an opportunity to then, if they have the smarts and the that the will for it, they could uh, move into the uh, rep reporting. So I thought that was pretty good. I went to the AP, and I talked. I went after I, I was working at an auction, automobile auction sales, and a daytime job, which I hated. But it was a job that kept the roof on my head and the food on the table, so to speak. But I. Um, went to the AP and I ran into the uh, good luck with the, one of the dictation operators before I could talk to anybody at the AP. And he said, do you, what, do you, what do you want? He said, uh, I, I'm uh, holding the fort here for the, for the office manager. And I told him, I said, I'd like to have a dictation. I'm di a dictation. He said, well, I'm a dictation operator and I'm going to be leaving here soon. And it was a night, night job of, from 5 to 11. And uh, he said, as soon as I get the job, if you want it, he said, I'll tell the manager that you're interested in it. I said, how soon is it going to be? He said, well, maybe a month or two. So I, uh, I had concentrated then on that. I figured, well, I have a job, and all I have to do is make sure I improve my typing and can take the dictation, put a set of earphones on and put a, uh, had a button on the floor. So when a reporter starts to dictate, you push your, put your foot on the button to cut off the, no, the, nose, the, nose of, the noise of the newsroom. And then when, if he gets ahead of you, or you're behind him, rather, in, in copying what he's saying, it's a typing it, you take your foot off the button, and he can hear the noise, and he'll stop dictating until, he, until you close out that noise again. And that, that's the way it worked, and it was a fascinating job. And it was uh, my introduction really into the real news of Washington. AP was the largest bureau, was located in the third floor of the Star, Evening Star Building at 11th of Pennsylvania Avenue. And I loved it. Where were you working when the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor? Well, I was at AP for two years. And I had a good experience. And now I thought I could. Uh, really merchandise my new talents here to experience in, a, in one of the bureaus of uh, the many bureaus here in Washington. Most were located in the National Press Building. There was the McClatchy Bureau, the, the Hearst Bureau, the, the uh, uh, Los Angeles Times Bureau, the New York uh, Chicago Tribune, the Chicago Times, New Orleans Times Picayune. They all had good sized bureaus in uh, Washington. And there were most of them located in the National Press Building. So I thought, well, I'll go into the Press Building and uh, get a job in one of these places. And the first thing I saw on the 11th floor, I didn't have any luck on, 12 or, on the 12th floor, but on the 11th floor, I saw the National Republican Congressional Committee. What are they doing here in the National Press Building? And uh, I went in sort of curiosity to wonder why a congressional committee was located here in the press building. So uh, the woman said, are you here to see about the job? Of course, I said, <laughs> yes. Well, what are your qualifications? Well, I said, I heard so much about the job. I don't know really what you want, but I said, if you tell me what you want, I think I can tell you whether I can fill the bill and we'll save time. Please have this time, it won't waste time. 
Well, she said to be working with a speechwriter in a hideaway office up at the Hill. He has his office here, but he works out of the Hill. We have an office on the fifth floor of the House office building, and he writes speeches, and he likes to dictate. He's a wire, re wire service reporter, and he likes to dictate his speeches right to the typewriter. I said, well, that's what I'm doing at AP. Oh, she said, you're the, one of the best qualified yet. She said, let me call Mr. Richardson. So she called him, and this February 1st, 1940, she called him and uh, said, uh, I think I have the band for you. He said, send him up. She said, he wants to see you. She gave me two quarters. She said, the fare to the hill is 20 cents and you give the cabbie a nickel tip. And I said, what do I do with the other quarter? I said, well, you have to come back. <laughs> a quarter was a lot of money. And anyway, I went up and uh, got the job. And uh, when my father, or he said, are you Republican or Democrat? I said, well, I'm a Pennsylvanian. I won't be able to vote until I'm 21. And I said, if I'll, re I'll go up to Pennsylvania and register. And if I get the job, I'll register Republican. And he said, that's OK. I just don't want a spy in the office. Well, I said, that's all right. I said, I, I don't like the idea of Roosevelt running for the third term. And I said, this is my way of protesting uh, Roosevelt running for the third term. And I said, I won't be a spy. I'll be on your side. So he hired me. And when my father heard and I went up to register, and he heard I registered Republican. He didn't like it worth a bit. And my sister, who's that still living at home, said, it's a good thing that you weren't living here when you were registered Republican. She said, Dad would have sold your bed. He said so. Anyway, he said the Republicans were hardest people. They do, you won't like them. He's, he was still smarting over his defeat of Al Smith. And uh, I took the job, and I met Wendell Wilkie, who got the nomination. Joe Martin had been chairman of that committee. He became later on Speaker of the House, but he became also chair of the Re Republican National Committee. And as my father was right, when the Republicans lost, Wilkie lost, Roosevelt won big. And the Republicans lost 40 seats in the House. I was the first out, and I was looking for a job again. And on my way home, walking up Jackson Place, in front of the White House in Jackson Place there at Lafayette Square, I ran into an old friend who was the secretary to Dr. Moulton, the president of Brookings Institution. And she knew me, and she knew when I came to Washington. And I did some work at Brookings. And uh, she was very happy I was working at Associated Press. And then she said, I guess you'll get a good job now with some of the Republicans coming in. I said, Miss Netherwood, there are no Republicans coming in. It's a dead end street. Margaret Chase Smith was the only one of the few Republicans elected. She took her husband's place, who was a congressman and died. And she ran and got his office. I went to her and she said, I'm not having your staff. I'm bringing a few people down from Maine. So there'd be no opportunity there. So Ms. Netherwood said, how about the Senate side? Would you like to work on the Senate side? I said, no, thanks. I had my fill of the hill. I'm going to try to the newspaper job again. And she said, that's a good job on the Republican side, on uh, the Senate side, and I think you could do it. I said, no, thanks. So I, we parted, and I started home. She lived nearby, and I just lived up in DuPont Circle. By the time I got home, the phone was ringing, and she said, John, are you sure you don't want to work on the Senate side? And I said, no. I said, by the way, who was the senator? Well, she said, oh, she said, I'll have to cancel the appointment. I said, I didn't know you made an appointment. So I was sure you wanted to, to take, you should take that job. I said, who was the senator? And she said, Hiram Johnson of California. And I said, well, I read about him in our civics class in high school. I'd like to meet him. Then you'll keep the appointment? I said, yes, I'd like to meet him. 
So it says tomorrow morning at 11 o'clock, and he, his had his office, he was entitled to a lot more space, but he elected to have three offices in the Capitol building, right under the rotunda, as his full California staff. He, and uh, he had a very small staff, and uh, I was going to work with him on, on uh, doing, helping do some research on his speeches. And uh, so I went in to his office, and the receptionist said, the Senator's waiting to see you. And I said, I didn't expect to meet him. She said, well, he wants to see you. So the first thing he said to me was, why do you want to work for me? And I said, well, Senator, I said, I really don't. And he kind of shook his shoulders and head and, I don't understand you. He said, you wanted to, he said, why did you come? I said, I wanted to meet you. And he said, I don't understand you. You want to meet me, but you don't want to work for me. And then he took time to tell me why I should work for him. And when he finished, I said, Senator, I think you're right. I'd like to take the job. And it was a fascinating job. He was the first Republican who came out for Franklin Roosevelt, the first Republican for Roosevelt. Roosevelt was aware of that, knew that Johnson was a power, former governor of California, ran on the Bull Moose ticket for vice president with Theodore Roosevelt. And a fascinating man and a unique man to work for. And knew where he was going. He was, uh, he was uh, a power and a block unto himself. And Roosevelt valued his judgment and called him. And uh, that's, it's a long answer to your question. Who, who were you working, what were you working <laughs> when Pearl Harbor happened? And I was working for Senator Hiram Johnson when Pearl Harbor happened. So what was your reaction to the attack and how quickly did you join the service? Well, I was, I was stunned. And I mean, why would Japan, and what were they intending to do, and how did, I mean, just attack Pearl Harbor, were they going to take over and run our country? Were they going to next now come to the, to the States? And to the, to the, it was frightful experience, and I, uh, the next morning, that was, that was Sunday, December 7th. Monday morning, Roosevelt, came to the joint session of Congress to tell what, what the Pearl Harbor attack and our declaration of war on Japan. And I, would, I walked down to the house side and up to the gallery. I didn't have a ticket, but some of the door tenders knew, knew me and they saw I was a staffer and they let me into the gallery. I, don't, I couldn't tell you really what Roosevelt said as much as what I was thinking. What, what does this war mean to me? And, what role do I play? Young, single, uh, healthy, and I, I'm, I'm, I'm cannon fodder, and uh, I better pick a place for me to be, or I'm just going to be the run of the mill, drafted and, and, and made a soldier. And I gave it a lot of thought, but I did hear the, the speech, and I went down to the Navy recruiting office the next day and said, here, I, I am, I'm enlisting. I decided I would rather be in the Navy rather than just be a soldier on the battlefield somewhere. At least in the Navy or on the ship, you have a place to, to stay. And if, if you're not successful and you're in the battle, chances are you, you go down and have a watery grave. And it's better than coming back to Walter Reed or Naval Bethesda, that, in my mind, armless or sightless or maimed forever. Uh, I didn't want that kind of a life. So uh, that's why I went to the Navy. They said, come back in a month, get rid of your apartment, and come back in a month. And the first job, they didn't send you out right away. They had you working in an office in Washington, right? Well, I came back in a month. I got rid of my apartment. I had an apartment with my brother at uh, up on 20th Street, and we got rid of all that stuff and the few belongings we had. And he, he went to the Navy also right after he put down and enlisted in the Navy. And but the, um, after I was sworn in, 
They said to report over to David Department on Constitution Avenue. There were temporary buildings there, the headquarters of Navy Department and the War Department. They had moved out of the State War and Navy Building, and um, the Navy Department uh, publication section was there, and I was assigned to the Navy Publications. I was very disappointed. I had visions of joining the Navy and to seeing the world and having a girl in every port and even though it was wartime they were bright side and uh, so long as you're at war why have a war that you could I won't say enjoy but at least get something out of it other than just drudgery of cannon fodder. I didn't like what I was doing in the, in the uh, code section the codes were published and then sent out to the commands, the, the sea commands as well as the land commands of the Navy. They were all mostly secret documents and the security was, was very important for the qualified, secure people and I fit the bill very simply and very easily for my Senate time. But I didn't like it and it was, it was horrible. So I would, Every month, for three months, I put in what the Navy called a chit requesting a ship. And some of the regular Navy people there said, you don't say you want a ship, you have to specify what you want. And I said, well, I, I just said a carrier, a battleship, a cruiser, a destroyer. And this one guy said to me, he said, I like destroyers. And he said, I was on a destroyer, that's good duty. So I said, I'll take a destroyer. So I asked for a destroyer. And, um, Finally, the, right after the third shift, the, the captain called me in and said, you still want to, your ship, you want to get out of here? I said, yes. He said, well, you got your ship and you're being transferred at noontime. And I said, well, wait a minute, Captain. I said, I'm not trying to duck this issue, but I said, I don't know how to be a sailor. I didn't go to boot camp. You put me right in here put a uniform on I me mean, later. I said, I just was working here with civilian clothes and we got the uniform. Then you sent me down to the Navy Yard. You didn't even have a ship down there, but I was to get the feel of the Navy. And that's my experience as a sailor. I don't know how to be a sailor on the ship. You do all right where you're going. You'll be all right. And I said, where is this ship? He said, 7th and Pennsylvania Avenue. There's no ship there. He said, it's the Office of Censorship. They're in the Federal Trade Commission building. I said, that's, that's my old boss at the Associated Press. Byron Price, the bureau chief, was appointed by Roosevelt to be director of censorship. And he called upon his able, bright young editor who had been my boss at AP the two years I was there. And he called me, he wanted me to be his assistant. And when he heard I was in the Navy, the, the, the Office of Censorship was made up of four divisions. One division was cable and radio censorship, which was under the responsibility of the Navy. And the Navy had a captain running that and was practically manned by Navy personnel. And this was then brought under the, uh, into the Office of Censorship, a civilian office directed by the former Associated Press Bureau Chief, Byron Price, who had moved up to New York to be the executive editor of the Associated Press. So, and the other part of censorship was the, operated by the War Department, the, the Army, and that was the, the uh, Travelers and, po uh, travelers and uh, Postal Censorship. Anything went through the post office or people going through, traveling through, uh, ports of uh, entry of east or west coast or along the borders, they were, they were uh, 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 monitored and their, ba their bales as the cable, any of the cablegrams were all monitored by the censorship representatives. Those two were the primary basis of the Office of Censorship, and then on top of that was the voluntary censorship of the press and radio. And Mr. Price said it is impossible to have a censor in every 
newspaper office in the, and radio station that carry news, and you'd have to consequently uh, uh, have these stations, the properties were owned by American citizens, and Price's suggestion was that they be, do their own censoring, be responsible for news to go into their paper or their, their stations, <coughs> And they would be responsible for the sense self-censoring, and that those four divisions were superimposed by a division of reports, where we would get requests from OSS and FBI to watch the exchange of communications or people traveling in or out of the country, and they, they re, those re, officer reports would maintain a, a watch list, and they would send us the names to be on the list. And when we saw something happening, to tell FBI or tell OSS what was going on. And then there was, of course, the administrative division. So I was right, signed to censorship, signed to the cable and radio, Navy established personnel operation, but loaned to the director's office. Now I felt I was doing something, even though I was still in Washington and still in uniform, I felt I was responsible and it was a remarkable experience. We knew all the movements of the president and we were able to tell the newspapers if to see the president through the press and radio division. If to see the president or someone like the president, uh, don't, don't put it in the paper until he's safely back in the White House. So we had a lot of inside information of that nature that I was privileged. And we, I was the, one who worked right directly with the deputy director, and that my Navy rate and uniform had no, no connection, strictly a civilian job, and that was just the mode of dress. It was a very uh, rewarding and a very great experience for me to have during the early part of World War II. Well, after, after uh, oh, just about 18 months, a little more, of that, the censorship. Now the uh, the war production revved up. Sh ships were being built, and uh, the uh, labor uh, market was being uh, helped immensely by Rosie the Riveter, the women coming into the workforce, and also the waves and the. Uh, the females that came into the Navy as well as the Army and Coast Guard, the Marines. It, uh, so now the able-bodied men at the desk were free to go to sea. And I was very pleased with that. Uh, I finally was now going to earn my Navy uniform and go to sea. And the uh, destroyer escort were turned out they built 500 of these destroyer escorts. My, my ship was the John Doe. It was built in San Francisco. And they needed men, of course, uh, to man these ships. Women, they weren't serving on the ships, only the shore stations. And I was assigned to the USS John Doe, DE destroyer escort 639. I, I was a yeoman and I, uh, I was in charge of the omen on the ship, and I enjoyed every bit of it. My battle station was a talker to the captain, and that was uh, the captain's position in battle, battle, uh, battle, time, battle stations, and I was uh, on the bridge. And there was an open bridge. That was the top part of the ship, highest part of the, the uh, ship, the bridge, the flying bridge, they call it, and that's where the captain ran and the whole and the gunnery officer ran all the war equipment on the ship, including the power of the ship, of course, the the, the turbines, the steam steam turbine, the steam electric, steam electric. And our our particular ship was that power plant. But we had three inch three three inch guns. 20 millimeter guns, 1.1, and three torpedoes, torpedoes two. And uh, all of that was operated from the bridge through to the captain and through the talkers. And it was also a, a vantage point for any battles. 
and we got into battle or searching for submarines or being uh, uh, of, uh, support for carriers or they lost planes. If the planes didn't make it off safely or returning to the ship, we would fish the pilot and help the plane get out of the out of the water. Out of if they if they didn't make the landing on the carrier, it was a very interesting experience. We they were primarily a, a convoy ship. The destroyers and destroyer escort was a modified destroyer. Destroyers were hardy ships. They were welded and took a while a time to build, but they in the mechanics of um, it developed so much the technological progress in World War II in building airplanes and tanks and airships, everything. They welded these ships, and they they were uh, uh, all all the responsibilities of a destroyer, only a little uh, little lighter. The destroyers of World War II were bigger than our ship, but we were primarily anti-submarine. Also, and we were had the secret weapons were just brand new then the radar and sonar to detect submarines, and the terrible thing in the Atlantic was the Hitler's Hitler's Nazi submarines were just running roughshod all over the Atlantic. The Atlantic beaches from Maine to Florida were hardly able to be used by civilians during this Battle of the Atlantic. The number of ships. They were sunk, and the oil from the ships, the uh, fuel, uh, fuel oil, were just globs of oil that were washed ashore of the beaches and made the beaches in, uninhabitable. They weren't able to use. You couldn't use the beaches. You walk on them. You just walk uh, through oil patches, heavy globs of oil, and, and debris from the ship. They were destroyed by the Nazi submarines. The Nazi submarines. They came as close to New York that they were spotted from Long Island, where the periscopes were just looking in, into the downtown of Manhattan. And uh, it's a fact there was one one submarine, Nazi submarine, that let spies off at the, out of Long Island. We knew about it, and they were picked up by the Coast Guard, and those spies were brought to Washington and given a trial for spies and other charges against them, and sentenced to be electrocuted. And they were electrocuted at the Fort McNair, the site that was a military prison for the District of Columbia. And there was there were these Nazi spies, I think there were four or five of them, at the same spot where the assassination leaders of Abraham Lincoln's assassination were hanged right. at the same same spot of Fort McNair. We know the major uh, engagement for the Jandro was at Okinawa. Where else prior to that did your ship see any action? We had many uh, reports of submarines, submarines in the area in our convoys. We were still, I, my service at the Jandro at the time was all in the Pacific. <clears throat> we were built in San Francisco, shaked down to San Diego, and then we reported to the Pacific Fleet at Pearl Harbor. And we operated from Pearl Harbor in the forward areas, seldom getting back to Pearl Harbor. I think we came back to Pearl in 18 months, twice. <coughs> we were down at, there was a French destroyer that we were charged to monitor and watch. And if that made any moves or changes, we were to follow it or report it. But that French destroyer didn't do a thing. They, was, they, <coughs> they were very happy being down at <coughs> in the Solomons. And they just they were at anchor all the time and didn't go anywhere. But we stayed there. We spent about six months just staying with them. And uh, it was pretty dull, but uh, and it was horrible. That was Iron Bottom Bay. That's in the area where Kennedy lost his ship. 
there were a number of, they, they call them Iron Bottom Bay because the, so many ships, J J Japanese as well as the U.S. ships, they were sunk and resting in the bottom of that, of that area in the Solomons. We uh, were operating with different convoys that went into the different battles at uh, o o Iwo Jima and the other Tinian and other island hopping that was done out there. We <coughs> were mostly, we, we did uh, accompany some troop ships, uh, uh, the smaller troop ships, the uh, advanced landing forces in some of those islands. They put people ashore those islands before the islands were <coughs> invaded by landing craft and so on. <coughs> So we, we had a lot of false enemy submarines, Japanese, uh, and we had flights that uh, were bogey, bogey, unidentified airplanes. Thank, thank God, most of them were friendly, our own planes. But the, the big action that was a horrible action at uh, Okinawa. We accompanied uh, landing ship, personnel landing, right into the shores and gave them cover while airplanes were giving us cover. And it was, a, uh, we got there the night before the uh, landing and we were there for the landings of, uh, at Okinawa. And it was, um, the Japanese let us land pretty much without too much resistance. But as soon as our troops were ashore, then they started to fire. And the, the troops ashore paid a high price at Okinawa. We, uh, <clears throat> Okinawa was where the Japanese unleashed their kamikazes. And the kamikazes, those suicide planes, were to just take off and crash land, or not land, but just crash into ships, capital ships. We had a what they call a picket line of its destroyers all the way practically to Japan from Okinawa. Where they would guard the shipping lanes and also report any of the uh, activity, air activity that we saw and working with the airplanes, our planes. But the kamikazes really fiercely attacked at those, all those picket ships. We operated with the Laffey. The Laffey was a destroyer, one of the ships we operated with, and that had 27 kamikaze attacks, and how it survived them, and still got to port, and they brought it back to the States and refurbished it, and it's today a museum ship down at South Carolina at, at Charleston. But we, um, we survived six kamikaze attacks. We shot two down, and we had good ship handling where we dodged. The captain was able to avoid the ship, the kamikaze, as he was aiming for our bridge, and outmaneuvered the ship, and they crashed and landed in the water. We had the submarine, we could see the wake of the submarine, or the uh, torpedo coming from a Japanese submarine, and uh, it, it was set too low. And it went below below the hull of our ship, and it went off and exploded. So Okinawa was also superimposed not only by the horrible, tremendous kamikaze attacks, but also we had two typhoons, mm. and the typhoons in the Pacific were unbelievable to experience. The waves were like mountains, and if you didn't know how to handle the ship. You were subject for the ship to turn so so much to the side that it might not make it right itself back. There were three destroyers that didn't survive. They turned too much, and water got in their stack and, it, and put their the fires out, and they were dead in the water. They didn't have any power, and the heavy loss of life. Three destroyers lost. We were very fortunate in surviving that. We were still on duty at Okinawa <clears throat> on a Sunday morning, and very it was quiet, and we were just cruising along, on watch, I mean on duty, to see what's going on. 
and we were struck by a shore battery <coughs> from Japan, from Okinawa, and it hit it right below our water line and uh, <coughs> exploded in our number one engine room, and we lost two men. I mean, they, were, they were just blown apart mm -hmm. in that number one engine room. We we were able to creep back into shore at Karamaretta, south of Okinawa, and we, they fixed us up and <clears throat> we reported it back for duty. After Okinawa, was there, did you go back to Pearl? <coughs> you, did you stay on active duty? What was the Well, there, what was, was, the a false, there was a false report. Japan had surrendered on August 15th. We were at Okinawa. <laughs> Moored alongside the Pennsylvania battleship, and earlier that afternoon, for some reason, or other, they changed it from getting to being moored alongside the battleship to be over to go to a, another another mooring. And that night, the Japanese bomber came in and dropped a torpedo into the half part of the Pennsylvania and killed 18, 17, or 18 men in the after part of the ship. We escorted the Pennsylvania. It was towed back to, to Guam, and we escorted it back. And then we went back to Okinawa. They, they put us, sent us on patrol duty or watch duty along the coast of China. And we did go into the northern part of Japan with the uh, uh, occupation troops. They were a place called Wakayama. And then we got orders to come home. To back to Pearl Harbor and then to San Francisco. We got to Pearl Harbor and orders were changed to go to Portland, Oregon. We arrived at Astoria at the mouth of the Columbia River to unload ammunition on Thanksgiving Eve 1945. And the Thanksgiving day, without, without our ammunition, we went up the Columbia River and landed in Portland, Oregon on Thanksgiving Day, a very appropriate day to return home. Certainly. Now, when you were on board, were you well aware of major events like the death of President Roosevelt and the bombings in Japan, the nuclear bombings? Oh, yes. We, 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 we had uh, very limited news, but we did have a, a two-hour radio shack that they monitored uh, a news uh, service that the Navy had telling us what was going on about Roosevelt's death and, and also the invasion of uh, June 6th in Europe, Normandy, but very limited. We, uh, we didn't really have much news. We didn't have any radio news. Uh, the radio, only the uh, Armed Forces radio that we were tuned into. Uh, we didn't hear Tokyo Rose, but we, if you if somebody did the radio shack dialed looking for that, we could find broadcasts like that. But we didn't have much time for that, uh, to listen to news. And we, we didn't know much about what was going in the outside world, one of the major events, as you just mentioned. Then how long did you stay in the service once you got back to Portland? Well, I had no intention of being a career man ever. I was a civilian sailor, and I knew it was my job to I think every person has a responsibility to serve their country in a way that uh, preserved the democracy that the Founding Fathers gave to us through bloodshed of their own. And I think every generation has the responsibility to maintain that type of a government, mainly through voting and to be, a, be a, being a, aware of who's running for office and to make the right selection in voting. <clears throat> so I, uh, I wanted to get out of the Navy. I, I was in now was just be four years, February 42 <clears throat> to February 40, well, the next February 46. But I, I had enough points to get out. <clears throat> and I was on leave. I got 30 days leave. I had no, no time off in the Navy since I enlisted in February 42. And in my, I wanted to get home and I wanted to get out. I wanted to get out before the gang exited the, the military and everybody looking for a job. 
But the uh, GI Bill was good. The, the government set up that to take a, a large part of the f uh, military force that was being thrown into the job market an opportunity to go to school. And the GI Bill of Education was was far far more a wonderful piece of legislation than the way they treated the veterans of World War I, where the poor bonus marches came to Washington to ask to, for the for payment of their bonus during the Depression years, and they were not treated very well here in Washington. But I wanted to get out of the Navy, and I wanted to get back. And I, when I got home, my sister had, came down from Pennsylvania when she finished high school, and she was working in the Federal Maritime Commission. And uh, she had met a young man from Boulder, Colorado, who came to study at Georgetown, and she, she lived in Georgetown. They, they lived in a in house on the same street in Georgetown, and met each other, saw each other going to work and school in the morning, and my aunt introduced them. She knew where Dick Bartlett lived, in. and uh, so the two women, the landladies, introduced them, and it was love at first sight. So my sister knew about a year or two, and they decided they'd get married that Christmas. And I was home, and that even made it better. I'd be home to be her only brother. She had two brothers, both older brother and younger brother, dead in the war. A younger brother in the Navy who died in ship's company. He had a brain tumor out in Bainbridge, Maryland. And my other brother was overseas with the civilian uh, builders in the Pacific. And uh, so I was the only one home. And I had to be back, and the day after Christmas, I just had to be back in Portland, Oregon. I had enough points to get out, and I uh, was frustrated. I wanted to get out. And I went up to the hill, and I said to the clerk of the Senate Naval Affairs Committee, you know me, you know I went down after the war, I mean after Roosevelt's speech, and I did my duty, and I want to get out. And I requested the captain or the executive of the ship to give me some more time in Washington to go to my sister's wedding. He says, report back as you should. I was very disappointed. My sister was disappointed. The clerk of the Senate Naval Affairs Committee, and Johnson, Senator Johnson was the ranking member of that committee. And he said, well, he said, the chief of naval operations was very fond of your boss, and your boss is very good to him. And he said, but people don't do favors for dead people. Anyway, he said, I will call the chief and see if he wants to do anything about your orders and go to your sister's wedding. So the chief said, a staffer from Hiram Johnson is back from the war. He said, I want to see him, send him down. So the chief of naval operations, uh, I'll take his name in a minute, came down and he said, oh, Hiram, he said, yeah, I could never thank him enough for all he did for the Navy and me too. And he said, what's your problem? I said, I just want to get out. I know I'm not a career man. And I went in early and I did my job and I want to get out before the exodus comes and makes it tougher in the job market for me to get back into the job market. And did you have your orders with you? So I, yes. So he called in his secretary and he dictated a modification of the orders to the commandant of the 13th Naval District that was out in Seattle. He modified my orders and uh, said you report to the Potomac River Naval Command go to the wedding, and then she'd be discharged. Hmm. I had enough points, I had everything, so there was no, no special favor, only the convenience. Well, that, that certainly worked out well. That was, that was a, a good connection to have. Your so work. that was the end of my Navy career. Now I was looking for a job back in Washington. I wanted to get back in the news business, and I heard about a job at broadcasting publications. And I went to see, there were two men from broadcasting uh, on the, in the press section. They were, I mean, we're back to broadcasting. They weren't with broadcasting when they were there, but I know they were at broadcasting. And I heard about this job, and I went down to see about it, and the uh, saltation of the owner, editor, and publisher 
So it's in the circulation department. And he said, we need, we need to replace our circulation manager. And this is the job. I said, well, I don't want circulation. But, well, he said, if, you, if you're here and you like to transfer or change over to the news side, we can arrange it. So with that in mind, I said, yes, I'll take the job. Well, sooner than they had expected, the, the circulation manager was moved to New York. And they said, the job is yours. Well, looking at it, being a department head in a business paper, the editor, the sales manager, the advertising man, and the circulation man. The three-legged stool that made a good business paper. And it was easier to be a department head than just be another staffer in the newsroom. So I took it, and I was glad I took it. We Television was just raising its head. We were to toying with ideas, starting another magazine. This was called Broadcasting, and Broadcasting covered radio and television. It was a weekly news magazine for the people who owned and operated radio, television, and now television coming in. So I went to New York and found a paper, a magazine in New York called Television, and the publisher wanted to sell it. He, it wasn't doing very well, but he had the good name, and it was a good, a good type of paper. It was like a fortune type of magazine about the business of television. And television was just learning how to, how to be just born, just growing up. Nobody knew exactly the power of the television, but only the, the three dimensions of having, seeing something and hearing it all at the same time. To, to that, those dimensions really made a, a tremendous force for advertisers. And that's what really, when you got a permit to build a, a radio, a television station, some people, it was like almost getting a license to steal. And so television was very productive. Television magazine came in and I was in charge of Broadcasting weekly, television monthly, and also we had special publications in the field for broadcasting, and uh, we were the dominant paper in the in the television field, and we wanted to maintain that. So I was director of publications, and was very happy with my job. I was there for twenty some years. Wow, how did you get affiliated with the National Press Club? Well, the broadcasting was in the National Press Building and uh, on the eighth floor. And everybody in broadcasting, the Saltation Off and the, you know, the rest of the news people were all members of the press club. And that was the place we would go for lunch and go up for a drink afterwards and sometimes even have breakfast up there. And uh, I got to know the press club, got to know the office, uh, people running for office. Uh, uh, well, the first thing, uh, what got me really involved was Ted Coop, my boss at the AP, the man who got me to censorship to be his assistant, he was now out of the job and he was now organizing the CBS newsroom in Washington. Radio News was developing and they didn't have it organized like they should have it, particularly the, the television was going so much, in many cases, growing out of radio. People owned radio, television was standing both sides. And it was, it was a time of a great uh, transition and change. And so CBS hired Ted Coop to run their, to organize their newsroom. And I said to saw the tradition when the man is elected president of the press club, that his paper puts out a special edition of the paper, an eight-page edition of the New York Times or the Chicago Tribune or whatever paper it was. And it's a mock paper about the special edition. And I said, why don't we put out a special broadcasting magazine in honor of the first radio newsman who became president of the press club? And he thought it was a good idea. He was all for it. Coop, we, we, he was very happy that broadcasting put out a special edition for his 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 term, or his administration, his year. So he said, "Why don't you be chairman of the publications and publicity committee of the press club?" 
So that got me in to more acti activities in the press club. And everybody liked the special addition to broadcasting. So the next president was an Associated Press man, and he said, I'm from the, commercial, the Memphis Commercial Appeal. Would you help put a paper out the Commercial Appeal? They're going to put a special issue. Would you help them how to do it like you did it? And the next man from Buffalo Evening News, and he said, the Buffalo Evening News is going to put out a Buffalo Curry Express. And would you do what you did with your liaison at least? So I found myself getting more involved with the presidents of the club and being appointed to good committees. Speaker's committee was the main one where the heads of state and everybody who had something to say wanted to make it at the press club because they got instant coverage. And I was there from 1953 sitting at the head table with the world leaders who came to Washington. I met Adenauer, Chancellor Adenauer, who was the Lord Mayor of Cologne, became the Chancellor of Germany and added, it just went on and on. It, and uh, the growth of television was sparkling with money. Everything was working. I met a woman, a bright young woman. I met her before the war, a native of Washington. We got married. And uh, Everything was going well. I was at broadcasting, the press club was going well, broadcasting was going well. And I was very fortunate in uh, enjoying every minute of it and doing some good while I was having a good time. You mentioned earlier that presidents back then were dues-paying members of the National Press Club. How would you compare the relationship between the presidency and the press then versus now? It's changed the whole the whole way of news reporting and newspapers. Uh, it's all changed, and that consequently has changed the president. The presidents of the U.S. don't even come to the press club anymore. Obama was there before he was president, but he hasn't been there since. The presidents love to come to the press club. But Woodrow Wilson used to walk over from the White House. That was his relief during his his time as president. And he loved to come to the page. He, partic he participated in some skits. And uh, Taft, Taft did too. He used to tell the story of Taft, the, big, you know, the biggest man, the biggest bathtub in the White House. It wasn't big enough for him. But he used to come over belly up to the press club bar. <laughs> it, was a, it was unbelievable. And the, the, the presidents want to be friends of, of the writers and the people who reported the news. And they didn't mind that they were privileged to pay their dues. Well, the, the presidents themselves, in many cases, it was the National Committee who paid the, the, the dues. But sometimes the presidents themselves paid, as Kennedy did when, his, when he learned he, he had to pay. He, he sent a personal check. Later on, his sister came to the press club and she said, uh, she was an ambassador to Ireland, and she was speaking at the club, and she said, by the way, I understand my brother was a member here. I said, yes, and I gave him his membership card after he paid his $90. See, he didn't pay any money. I said, his own, no, she said, not his own money. She said, our father didn't allow that. And that was true, I heard that story many times. I said, well, I had his personal check you didn't cash it. I said, yes, we cashed it. She said, that was worth money. I said, Ambassador, that's why we cashed it. <laughs> but I did make a Xerox copy of it before. And, uh, but today, the uh, president controls his own news conference. He, um, Reagan did come over to the press club at a news conference. And uh, Carter announced his running for president from the press club. Truman loved to come to the press club. Came over frequently as senator and also and also Nixon. Nixon had the, the Copley Bureau, the Copley Press, big big papers in the, uh, California and Illinois. Uh, we had the bureau there, and he used to come over with the bureau chief, 
And he loved the press club. He came to a lot of activities at the press club, brought his daughters over to the father-daughter night. It was a, uh, uh, it was a different world. And today, uh, the security of the president is one of the main reasons that the president comes to the press club. The security of the, uh, the president and the, the swarms of people that travel with him. It, it just makes it impossible for anybody to enjoy the activities or whatever it is where the president is involved. And uh, it, it's a different world, even the White House where the gates were always open, the White House is now is, is in prison. They have a, a fence within the, uh, within the fence, with another fence outside the fence. It, it's just unbelievable how uh, the security has changed the world and what security has changed the world of television and the way television has presented the news. There was no news cycle of eight o'clock at night or eight o'clock in the morning for news breaks and news changes. Now it, the news happens, it's reported and sometimes it's reported without being fully, fully uh, reviewed. Uh, hearsay gets in, gets into the news stream without being validated or properly checked. So the news, the news business is going through. The press club has suffered accordingly. The membership is now, it's holding at 3,000, but in 1961 at the height of television and all the golden days of television in the beginning, the press club membership was over 5,000. And, uh, but and that many of the newspapers pay the dues of the reporters to join the press club. And now that's an expense for reporters that they don't, if they have to go to the press club, they go to it for the working to cover the news, whatever. A luncheon speaker might be generating news, but it's a different, different club. It's a downtown club, but there is still, and the, many of the bureaus in the club have shut down. There's only one bureau left in town, I think, the McClatchy Bureau. The Hearst Bureau is shut down. The larger paper, the Daily Oklahoma, had a paper that's no longer a, a, a paper, a bureau. The Chicago Tribune had a big, big Washington Bureau. That's gone. The Dallas Morning News had a good side. It's gone. And consequently, the nature of the press club has changed accordingly. The news world is going through a transition. There will always be news, and the news for reporters, that they called at one time the news, the, the, the fifth estate. And uh, it's still the fifth estate. We still need good reporters. We need reporters and writers who understand government, understand how government is operated, how committees function, reporting on the work of the committees, appropriations committees particularly, and to know what's going on and to inform the public. A, a free press really is the lubricant of a wheels of democracy, or it might be the engine of a democracy. That's how important the free press and the First Amendment is to, to the news world. And the news world has to maintain, it's just a matter, it's not printed anymore like we used to the printed word, but I don't see how we can get away from the printed word. It's going to be downgraded and you're going to get your news maybe just on a transmitter on your watch, in place of the watch, or maybe part of the watch, the way that the world is developing in the technical world today, your telephone is a, is, a, is, a, is a camera as well as a radio station. Your instant project, whenever you want to re re reach someone to buy their cell phone, it, it's, it's hard to say it in a few words. That's the more business side of the press club. Uh, what, what are some of the more memorable moments in your years at the press club, whether it's a a dramatic event, a humorous event. Uh, what, what do you think of when you think of the, the best memories from the well, press club? Well, 
There are many for me, but one I think that I wasn't there at the time, but I think the picture has been photographed, the one photo that's been used over and over again, and uh, it generated a tremendous amount of interest. It was during World War II when, uh, when the Prescott had a war, uh, uh, canteen for the men and women in the service. And every Saturday afternoon, the press club was open, the big ballroom there, hot dogs, hamburgers, beer, Coke, come up, and also some food. Uh, I mean, uh, besides that, it's more substantial food and drink. Uh, and we'd, we'd invite uh, the Cong members of the Congress or the court or uh, any official activity, even the press itself, that some of the but the, the press wasn't known as they were, they were they, as they got to be known through television, the Cronkites and the, and the, the, the personalities on television. So the, the press wasn't really that well known during the early part of World War II. But anyway, some, some of them would come down and they would serve uh, the stuff. And even Truman, who used to come and would do the club and knew the members, was invited down when he was, right after he became vice president. And of course, he played the piano, and he played it pretty good. And he, he, he was a happy man, and he loved, the, he loved the press. And he said, I don't get upset with the questions that you ask me at news conference or any time. He said, I learn what, what America is thinking through you people. You represent America. And you ask the questions that uh, other people would ask if they could come. So I don't get mad at you. And he, he had a different attitude today. Obama has a list of people you call upon because he doesn't want to call upon the wrong people who spark an argument almost or an embarrassment. So Truman had that, that flair with the press and he was liked and appreciated. So he came over to the canteen and he's now playing the piano. <clears throat> the photographer says, hey, Mr. Vice President, turn around. We want to see you. We don't want the back of your head. We want to see you. And you know how the photographers are, and one more, one more, and somebody else said one more, one more. So it went on for a little time, and by the time Truman turned back to play the piano, he was just he turned around like this. Lauren Bacall was draped over the top of the piano, and she was just stretched out on the piano. And he, he was as surprised as any, a lot of people were. And the photographers had taken lots of pictures then of Lauren Bacall. She was a, just an unknown starlet from Hollywood, and she just was in a picture with Humphrey Bogart that was just, I guess, uh, that one of Africa, I forget the, the, the name of it right now. But anyway, um, that picture was a, a moment that lived forever, and the picture is still being taken. Uh, and Mrs. Truman, uh, Margaret came down and she was talking about one of her books that she wrote and she, Margaret, want to show your father's piano. I don't want to see that damn piano. You embarrass my father. You mean the vice president, you demean the vice president, but I haven't put in that star that up there. And uh, she was mad. And my mother feels the same way. I mean, Miss, when Mrs. Truman came to the club for one reason, somebody else said, you know, see the piano. I don't want to see that, and that was terrible what you did. Lauren Bacall was asked her back, and she was in the club a couple of times to show her the piano, and she's mad. So <laughs> the, picture, the picture was a happy time, really generated a lot of ill will in that, in that circle. So that was one of the highlights of, uh, of the press club. Another, I was not there then, but uh, another time was uh, when Khrushchev came. Bill Lawrence was the president of the club. He was representing the New York Times, a great political writer. And uh, he maneuvered, uh, he got Castro, who was coming, the newspaper editors invited him to come to their convention in Washington. Eisenhower said he didn't want to see him and don't ask him. So I was the president at the time, and he didn't want, want to, uh, no, that, that, that's Castro, I'm sorry, Castro. Khrushchev was a different story. Khrushchev was coming under good, but that was all the same year, Bill Lawrence's year. But Khrushchev, um, the women wanted to come. Women were not members of the press club, and uh, it, 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 was, it was wrong, it was not fair. 
Eleanor Roosevelt was responsible for a lot of women coming into the news world and into the press because when she had a news conference, she said, only women can cover my news conference. And that's the way Eleanor Roosevelt helped establish a great female uh, center of writers in Washington to cover her. And now, well, the press come never admitted to it. A lot of it was, it wasn't because they weren't qualified. They were better. Mary McGrory and some of those, some of those women were as good as any man, male writers, but uh, they weren't, and they weren't members of the press club. But there was a, they, they had their own press club for one reason. But there became an animosity of the two clubs, and the women were using the National Press Club. We gave them the facilities and gave them a dining room where they could meet and have their meetings in the in the National Press Club and not charge them anything, only pay for they had any food to pay for, their food, which we all paid. There was no, no credit. And that, that created some bad will. And that was the main problem of women not being members of the National Press. It wasn't because of their qualifications. It, wasn't, it was only because of that, of that animosity. Anyway, now the women wanted to come to Khrushchev. And they went to the Russian ambassador, Soviet ambassador at the time, Soviet and said uh, they wanted to uh, cover Khrushchev, and if the Preska wouldn't let him, they wanted Khrushchev to go to some other event, to go to a hotel, go to the National Guard Army, where they could go somewhere where we all could cover you. Bill Lawrence said, I will certify the responsible women who are assigned to cover Khrushchev, and you will be welcome at the Preska. And then they said, well, who's going to decide this? Bill said, I'm going to decide. Well, you're going to pick your favorites, some over here. So it became another controversy. Anyway, Khrushchev came. There were women there. And it was quite a, uh, a luncheon to Khrushchev and the, the limited women who were there. And uh, he, he liked the way he was treated. It, it all worked very well. And then he was escorted across the country by Henry Cavill Lodge, who was a member of the press club and knew the club well and as a senator. Now he was the ambassador to the UN. So Henry Cavill Lodge was the escort officer for Khrushchev on his trip across the country out to Hollywood and to see Hollywood and then come back to the farm in Iowa and then come back to Washington. And they came we go back to Washington and visit Ike up at Ike's farm. And then from Mike's farm, the Soviet embassy made, a, uh, made arrangements for a news conference to wrap up the Khrushchev visit at the press club. So Khrushchev was really at the press club twice, once the luncheon and the other just a, a closed uh, uh, news conference by the embassy at the press club. And uh, I was part of the group that was at the reception committee before we went out to the hall to start the news conference. And Troyanowski was his translator. Young Troyanowski later on became, I think he became ambassador to the UN. But Troyanowski was educated. He was here as the son of a diplomat. I think he went to Sidwell Friends too. And he, uh, he was a very good translator, interpreter. And he was standing right alongside of Khrushchev answering questions during this reception. And I asked a question. I said, uh, Mr. Chairman, that we called him Khrushchev, what was uh, the highlight of your trip and what would you uh, like to take back with you uh, if, this, if it reaches that degree? Oh, he said uh, through Torinowski, he said the uh, highlight was the helicopter. I love your helicopter. And he rode the helicopter from, from Ike's farm in Gettysburg to Andrews, then he came over to the press club. He said, I, I said I'd like to have two. And just about that time, Ernie Barcello, who was on the board, and also the board was invited to this reception. And Bernie, Ernie was United Press, UPI, and he pulled out his pad and he started right. And Kutov looked over to Tronowski and said, tell him I didn't think the news conference had started yet. And Bernie, Ernie, Got the got the message. He, sorry, Mr. Chairman. 
pulled out his pad, put it back in his pocket. But just a little incident of how Crucho, how clever Khrushchev was, and uh, how, uh, how mindful he was of what a news conference was. And he was, he didn't want one man to get a, a lead or a head start on, on the people who'd be covering, including Tass would be there too, of course. So that, that was another highlight. I think meeting Adenauer, Adenauer wanted to come. I, he, I first met him in 1953. Now in 1961, he was coming back to Washington. I'm the president now. And uh, they set a date, and we had it all date, all set. And the embassy canceled it. They said he plans change. He's going to be a week later. And a week later, we had a luncheon. And the, the tradition at the press club was every press club luncheon is a newsmaker luncheon. Every one is important as the other one. And you don't cancel one because you got a bigger one, or a better one, or whatever. And I said, we have a date that, and I said, we can't cancel it. But I said, as an alternative, we could have all the same format as a, as a uh, luncheon, except for the food. We'll have a head table, the head table with the representatives that Adenauer has with him, and rep representatives at the uh, Soviet embassy, I mean the German embassy, would like to have. So the ambassador said, that's okay. So we'll have at 3 o'clock, we'll have a news conference at the press club, luncheon style. And then the ambassador, through his press secretary, who, made, who was making the arrangements from there on, called and said, uh, The chancellor wants to meet with Secretary Hodges, the Secretary of Commerce, and the secretary will come over and make it convenient for the chancellor and to meet at the press club if you have a room that they could have their meeting in. Hodges just had to come from Commerce that's just across the street, as you know. So um, Hodges came over, and he was at the news conference, and then as soon as the news conference was over, he we had a room they call the East Lounge, where they, they could have their meeting. But the um, Adenauer, uh, that's what part I wanted to say, had been to the White House before he came to the press club. Adenauer, all his words were German. But he did know some English, but he never spoke it officially. He never wanted to speak in, in, in English because he might be misinterpreted or mis, mis, uh, miscast in something. And if there are any German reporters there, they might not understand English. And they, they had an agreement with him that he'd only speak German for any news. But I, I learned that he, 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 he did have some little English. So I, I also knew there'd be a very limited exchange. So after the before uh, before Hodges came back, Hodges had something to do, and they, anyway, there was a little bit of a time there. And I said to the chancellor, I said, "Did you meet Mrs. Kennedy?" "Oh yes, and the baby, and the babino, I think babino or something called it. the Kirk, the Kirk, the German for child." And the baby, that was John John. And he, he really lit up and they wanted to talk about that. And he, I, but first uh, he said how pretty Jackie was and the baby and he, he was upstairs and saw how impressed he was. And it was a nice conversation we had going. The limited German and, I mean, the English that, uh, and, but I tried to use words that he wouldn't, understand and it was a nice conversation about the Kennedys and how impressed he was with John John. Those are two of the highlights uh, of, well, just but there were many many interesting things that happened at the press club. Anybody who had news to make wanted to make it at the press club. You'd be surprised how many offers you had as chairman of the speakers committee to book a 
program, who some of the later on we uh, C-SPAN covered all those lunches live national public radio. There were live broadcasts of these lunches, and now they do television. They do C-SPAN to the television. They were um, lots of highlights. And De Gaulle came on a Saturday, and he, that's the only time he could make the press club. So we press club really didn't function much on Saturday, but we had a De Gaulle luncheon on a Saturday. NBC carried that live, and uh, that was another, another highlight. There was another time that the press club was scooped. The British ambassador was going to speak at the press club, and it was going to be covered by that was the foreign minister, Anthony Eden. And they wanted to do it live for BBC. So they closed the doors, and there'd be no movement of people in or out of the room during the time the BBC was covering this luncheon live, the speaking part of the luncheon. And the U.S. reporters were writing the story of Anthony Eden, and they dashed out to so like a news conference after the meeting to, to report it to their bureau, to their papers. And they, we have the UP and AP machines right outside the ballroom, just as monitors for the use of the club. They always had those machines there. And here was the luncheon that just happened, was on the machine, reported from London. They were news people in London covered it from the broadcast that was going live, the BBC, and it was just uh, all the reporters who were covering Anthony Eden at the press club were scooped. <laughs> Those are some of the highlights. Uh, just a couple minutes left in our conversation, sir, and just as a wrap-up question, yeah. when you think about your distinguished career, your your, your service to our country. What are you most proud of? Well, first of all, I'm very grateful that I've had uh, good luck in being at the right time, at the right place. From my early days, getting a job with Associated Press, they had some contacts at Brookings. And one, one, I didn't know really what I wanted to do except be in the news business, and I, I did spend my whole life in the news business. A lot of good fortune at the press club, and the press club of the world came to the press club, and I was there. I was very honored when I think of the three branches of government at my inauguration. And because I did a favor for Ted Coop at CBS by recommending broadcast publish a paper for Ted's inauguration, Frank Stanton was very grateful. Frank Stanton was running CBS at the time. And he said, John, for your inauguration, I'm sending down some entertainment for you. He didn't know Kennedy was coming over. I didn't. Yeah, I heard of that. But he sent down Sid Caesar to run the entertainment that night. Jim Haggerty was a friend of mine. He was Ike's press secretary, the outgoing president. Pierre became a friend, got to know him. And he was the, the, the entertainment that night. The, the first part of it was Jim Haggerty, outgoing press secretary, for, who was the master of ceremonies. The second half, Pierre Salinger, and he played the piano. He was a piano player, too. The three branches of government, the chief justice, a friend that I met through Hiram Johnson's office when he was attorney general of California, we kept in touch. And Sam Herberg, a member of the club, and Kennedy coming over to get his card. That was that was surely a highlight, and uh, the Navy band, the Navy band came and performed that night at my inaugural. I've been a very lucky person. I was lucky in love. My wife was a wonderful woman. We were married 51 years, and uh, we had very happy times together. We she enjoyed my life. She never was. A part like some wives to get involved in the business. She supported it, but she never was involved with it. I um, uh, 
had the good health to survive and to remember the years and uh, to enjoy them now at 97. And one of the things I was thinking the other day, 100 is not very far away, but I don't know what kind of condition, what physical or mental condition I'll be in. I see too many people coming down with Alzheimer's, uh, horrible diseases, uh, cancer, and so on. And I had a thought the next year I might have a party at the press club and I'll, I'll pay for it. It's not going to be that much. And the proceeds will go to the Press Club Institute, which is our awards group, and they're always looking for money. And uh, I'll call it, can't wait for a hundred. <laughs> and that's my next aim and the goal. Well, you're not, as you said, you're getting close and you're in fantastic shape. So it'll be 97 next week, or the 25th. Amazing, amazing. So it's only three years to go. So well, you I look great. I, I think I might as well enjoy, enjoy the, the party <laughs> while I can enjoy it. Sounds like a good plan to me. Mr. Cosgrove, thank you so much for your service to our country, and uh, thank you for all the work that you've done. Thank you for your time with us today. Well, thank you for putting up with these stories, and I hope you they add something to the veterans and the service people and the history of World War II. Oh, they certainly will. John P. Cosgrove, World War II veteran, U.S. Navy, and former president of the National Press Club. I'm Greg Corumbus.